Today we are going to learn a new chapter from the textbook of history. Chapter 8. The name of the chapter is Vital Villages, Thriving Towns. Vital Villages, Thriving Towns. Vital. Vital means important. Important villages and thriving towns. Thriving means prosperous and growing. Prosperous and growing or flourishing, flourishing, developing towns. So, vital villages, thriving towns. And already we know that things made of iron and steel are a part of our daily life. The things made of iron and steel are a part of our daily life. And the use of iron began in the subcontinent around 3000 years ago. So, the use of iron began in the subcontinent around 3000 years ago. So, some of the largest collections of iron tools, some of the largest collections of iron tools and weapons were found in the megalithic burials. So, already we studied that in the megalith burials, there were largest collections of iron tools and weapons. So, the made of iron, the things made of iron and steel are a part of our daily life. So, around 2500 years ago, there is evidence for the growing use of iron tools. So, around 2500 years ago, there is evidences for the growing use of iron tools, the growing, the developing use of iron tools. So, these include access of clearing forest, some examples, access of clearing forest and the iron plug share the iron plug share. Plug share means the sharp blade of a pluff. The sharp blade of a pluff. And the pluff share was useful for increasing agricultural production. So, the pluff share was useful for increasing agricultural production. So, which are the other steps to increase production? Which are the other steps to, steps to increase production? A irrigation. So, what is meant by irrigation? How you heard about the term irrigation? What is meant by irrigation? The supply of water to land or crops to the help growth by, me, by the means of channels is known as irrigation. So, the supply of water to land or crops to help growth by means of channels, it is known as irrigation. So, the kings and kingdoms could have not existed without the support of flourishing villages. So, the kings and kingdoms could not have existed without the support of flourishing villages. That means, with the support of flourishing villages, with the support of developed villages, the kings and kingdoms could have existed. So, without their support, the kings and kingdoms could not have existed. And while no tools and the system of Transplantation increased production, irrigation was also used. So, while new tools and that system of transplantation, what is meant by transplantation? Transplanting, replanting, replanting to lift and reset a plant in another soil or situation is known as transplanting. So, what is meant by transplanting? Replanting, replanting. To lift and reset a plant in another soil or situation is known as replanting. So, new tools and the system of replantation increase production. So, that's why irrigation was also increased. Irrigation was also used. So, irrigation works that were built during this time included canals, wells, tanks and artificial lakes. So, irrigation works irrigation works or make possible through different channels like canals, wells, tanks and artificial lakes. So, when the new tools and system of transplantation increase, production also increase and the production increase with the support of the irrigation. And the irrigation works that were built during this time included canals, wells, tanks and artificial lakes. So, in the next page there was given some of the stages in the construction of irrigation. Some of the stages in the construction of irrigation works. And we need to arrange it properly. So, first one already given there. 
Kings need money for armies, palaces and fort. So king need money for what? For maintaining armies and building palaces and fort. So next one, they demanded tax from farmers. So king need more money. That's why they demand taxes from the farmers. So next one what? Third one, farmers have to increase production to pay taxes. Farmers have to increase production to pay taxes. Then what uh, this is possible with the irrigation. When production need to increase, in order to increase the production, irrigation facilities also need to increase or this is possible with the irrigation. Production will increase only with the support of the irrigation. Then next, which one? Kings provide money and plan irrigation works. Kings provide money and plan irrigation works. Kings provide money and they plan irrigation works. Then next, labor is provided by the people. Labor is provided by the people. Labor is provided by the people. Then production increases and so does revenue. It generates revenue. Then lastly, farmers also benefit because crop production is more certain. Crop production is more certain. So how it will come as in order? Kings need money for army, armies, play palaces and a fort. Kings need money for armies, palaces, forts. They demand the tax from farmers. Farmers have to increase production to pay taxes. Then this is possible with the irrigation. Kings provide money and plan irrigation works. Labor is provided by the people. Then production increases. So does revenue. Lastly, farmers also benefit because crop production is more certain. Then who lived in the villages? Who lived in the villages? So there were at least three different kind of people living in most villages in the southern and northern part of the continent. So there were Three different kind of people lived. Who lived in the village? Mainly three type of people. Three kinds of people lived there. Which are they? Vellalar, Ujavar and Kadesiar or Adime. So these are the three different kinds of people lived in the village. Which are they? Vellalar. Vellalar means in the Tamil region, large landowners were known as Vellalar. Large land owners in the Tamil region, they were known as Vellalar. So in the Tamil region, large land owners were known as Vellalar. Then ordinary ploughmen were known as Ujavar. Ordinary ploughmen, agriculturist, farmers and ordinary ploughmen and they were known as Ujavar Uja or Ujavar. Then landless labors landless labors and including slaves and they were known as Kadesiyar and Adimai. Kadesiyar and Adimai. So these are the th three important um, kinds of people lived in the village which are the Vellalar. Vellalar means uh, the land owners. So the large land owners of the Tamil region and they were known as Vellalar and uh, Ordinary ploughmen and they were known as Ujavar. Ordinary ploughmen and they were known as Ujavar. And landless labors. Landless labors are known as which one? Kadesiyar and Adime. Kadesiyar and Adime. And they are slaves. So these are the three kind of people lived in that time in the village. So in the northern part of the country, the village headman was known as the Grama Pojaga. So the village headman, the village headman known as Grama Fojaga. What was the name of that village headman? Grama Fojaga. And usually men from the same family held the position for generations. So Grama Fojaga, that is the men from the same family held the position for generations. And in other words, the post was hereditary. This Grama Fojaga post was hereditary. From one um, member to another next one, it is uh, hereditary. It, this uh, same family members became the Grama Fojaga one by one. And the Grama Fojaga was often the largest land owner. The Grama Fojaga was also largest land owner. 
and generally he had slaves and hired workers to cultivate the land. The Grama Pojaga had slaves and he, the, the Grama Pojaga hired or rendered workers to cultivate the land. The Grama Pojaga had slaves and hired workers to cultivate the land. And besides, as he was powerful, the king often used him to collect taxes from the village. So he was very powerful. Ramaphojaga was very powerful. That's why the king often used him to collect taxes from the village. He also functioned as a judge and sometimes as a policeman. So Ramaphoja, Pojaga worked and he was actually a largest landowner and he worked as a um, policeman, same time judge, the same time he collect taxes from the village. So Grama Pojaga had slaves and hired or rented workers to cultivate the land and as he was so much powerful and he was powerful that's why the king used him to collect taxes from the village and he also functioned as the judge and sometimes a policeman. So apart from the Grama Pojaga there were other independent farmers known as Grehapadis. So the uh, apart from the Grama Pojaga, there were other independent farmers. And what were the name of that one? Grehapadis. Grehapadis. And most of whom were smaller landowners. Smaller landowners. So the bigger or large landowners are known as Grama Pojaga. The largest landowner is known as Grama Pojaga. And the smaller landowners is known as which one? Grehapadis. The smaller landowners are known as Grehapadis. Grehapadis. And, and then there were men and women such as the Dasa Karamkara who did not own land and had to earn a living working on the field owned by others. So apart from the Grama Pojaga, there were other independent farmers known as Grehapadis. So Grama Pojaga means largest landowner. Largest landowners were known as Grama Pojaga and smaller landowners were known as Grehapadis. Grehapadis. Smaller land landowners. Smaller landowners were known as Grehapadis. And then there were men and women such as the Dasa Karamkara who did not own land. Dasa Karamkara and they did not have land. They did not own land. And had to earn a lively working on the field owned by others. And the Dasa Karamkara, they earn a living working on the field owned by others. In most villages there were also some craft person such as blacksmith, potter, carpenter and weaver. So these are the people lived in the in that time in the village. And which are the people lived in that time in the village? Different kinds of people. Different kinds of people lived in that time in the village. Which are they? Vellalar, Ujavar, and Kadesiar and Adimai, Gramapojaga, Gregapadis, and Dasa Karamkara, and then Dasa Karamkara after that some craft people. The, some craft persons like blacksmith, potter, carpenter and weaver. So these are the different kinds of people lived in the most of the villages in the southern and the northern part of the subcontinent. And who were the important people or different kinds of people lived in the most village in the southern and northern part of the subcontinent in the ancient time? Who, who were they? Vellalar, Ujavar, Kadesiar and Adima, Gramapojaga. Gramapojaga means the largest landowner. The largest landowners were known as Gramapojaga. And after that, smaller landowners. And they were known as Grehapadis. After that, Dasa Karamkara. Dasa or Karamkara, like slaves. Our workers. And then craft persons such as blacksmith, potter, carpenter and weaver. So these are the important or different kinds of people living in the most villages in the southern and northern part of the subcontinent. 
Next we are going to learn about one of the important thing in this chapter that is Sangam literature. Sangam literature. So the earliest Tamil compositions are were known as Sangam literature. So some of the earliest work in Tamil known as Sangam literature were composed around 2300 years ago. Sangam literature were composed around 2300 years ago and these were the earliest works in Tamil and these texts were called Sangam because they were supposed to have been composed and compiled in assemblies. Assemblies known as Sangam. Assemblies known as Sangam and these are the Sangams of poet, assemblies of poet and that were held in the city of Madurai and the Tamil terms mentioned above are found in Sangam literature. So the Sangam literature means the, the earliest Tamil compositions were known as Sangam literature and why these were known as Sangam literature because these texts were called Sangam because they were supposed to have been composed and compiled in assemblies of poets, assemblies of poets, Sangam of poets. That's why these were known as Sangam literature. And Sangam literature means the earliest Tamil compositions are known as Sangam literature. And these assemblies were held in the city of Madurai in Tamil Nadu. Then next we are going to learn about how do we find out about cities of subcontinent? How do we find out about the early cities of subcontinent? So we find out about early cities of the subcontinent through the following, which are the ways, stories or collections of ancient, ancient stories or collections of ancient stories, then description of travelers and sailors, description of travelers and sailors, then sculpture, after that archaeology. So these are the different ways or methods find out early cities of subcontinent. So how do we find out about early cities of subcontinent? So which are the different ways we can find out about early cities in the subcontinent? So which are the different ways? First one, stories or collection of ancient stories. Description of travelers and sailors. Description of travelers and sailors. The next sculpture. Sculpture. And the last one archaeology. Archaeology. These are the different methods we find out about early cities of subcontinent. So first one stories. Stories. The, the Jadagas were stories that were probably composed by ordinary people and then written and uh, written down and preserved by Buddhist monks. So what, what were known as Jadagas? The Jadagas, the Jadagas were stories, the Jadagas were stories and that were probably composed by ordinary people and then written down and preserved by Buddhist monk. So it is written by the ordinary people and it is written down and preserved by Buddhist monks. And the Jadagas through sufficient light on the lives of the people who used to like this. So the Jadagas gave sufficient light, light on the life of the people who used the like this. So the stories or collection of ancient stories that were known as Jadagas. Jadagas are one of the important sources of the air, life of the early cities of the subcontinent. And next one, travelers and sailors, travelers and sailors. Then, another way of finding out about early cities is from the accounts of sailors and travelers who visited them. And one of the most detailed account that has been found was by one unknown Greek sailor. And he described all the port he visited. And one unknown Greek sailor, he described all the port he visited in ancient India or ancient subcontinent. And uh, travelers and sailors gave a beautiful account of the towns or villages in the ancient India or ancient subcontinent. So travelers and sailors and they gave a variety of experience, their experience about the places which were they visited. 
then next is sculptures sculptures means art of making statues by carving or modeling it is known as sculptures sculpture means art of making statues by carving art of making statues by carving is known as sculpture so we can use other kind of evidences to find out about life in some of these early cities sculptures carved scenes depicting people's life in towns and villages as well as in the forest so the sculptures carved scenes depicting people life in town and village as well as in the forest so the people and who were live in town village or forest and their life and all very beautifully depicted and or carved in where in the caves or any other rocks or somewhere and these were known as sculptures and these sculptures gave one beautiful account of the city life or village life or forest life then many of these sculptures were used to decorate rails pillars and gateways of building that were visited by people for example we can see sanchi for a site with the stupas in madhya pradesh sanchi stupa in madhya pradesh and this place shows us some beautiful scenes in that city and this sanchi stupa and there where we could see beautiful scenes in that city beautiful scenes in that city and uh, these three stories travelers and sailors sculptures and one more is there that is archaeology archaeology also gave a beautiful account of the life of the people in the subcontinent so in many cities archaeologists have found uh, rows of pot or ceramic rings arranged one on top of the other so in many cities archaeologists have found archaeologists found rows of pot or ceramic rings ceramic means made of clay and permanently hardened by heat made of clay and permanently hardened by heat it is known as ceramic so archaeologists found a rows of pot pot or ceramic rings arranged one on top of the other and we have been point out that uh, some rings wells by the archaeologist in early cities some rings rings wells also they found so these rings wells seem to have been used as toilet in some cases and as drains and uh, maybe in garbage dumps so the archaeologist found some rings in the city these rings may be they used to or they have been used to which one may be as toilet or drains and garbage garbage bins and uh, or garbage dumps so these rings well are usually found in individual houses also so these rings well these these ring well were also found in individual house also individual houses also things these rings were found so we have hardly any remains of palaces market or homes of ordinary people and if we have hardly any remains so we couldn't see any remains of palaces market or of homes of ordinary people so perhaps some remain to be discovered by archaeologist other made of wood mud brick and thatch may not have survived so maybe other uh, type of the this uh, remains and all may be made of wood or mud brick and thatch thatch means cover a roof or a building with straw or a similar material it is known as thatch so that's why it may not have survived so anyway these things and all gave a beautiful account of the ancient city of the subcontinent Mr. Coins and archaeologists have found several thousands of coins belongs to this period. Archaeologists found several thousands coins and uh, it belong to this period. And the earliest coins which were in use for about 500 years ago and 500 years were punch mark coin. And they have been given this name because the designs were punched onto the metal, silver or copper so punch mark coins were found by the archaeologist so this punch mark 
coin and they have been given this name why because the designs were punched the designs were punched onto the metal silver or copper and these coins were maybe used as a medium of exchange these coins were used as a medium of exchange but we should remember that coins were not only means of exchange other articles such as paddy salt and some animals were also used as the means of exchange so not only coins but the paddy but also the paddy and the salt and some animals were also used as a means of exchange anyway punch mark coins found by the archaeologist and it proved that their medium trade existed there then cities with the many functions and cities with the many functions and functions performed in early cities like madura so which are the functions performed in early cities like madura cities with the many functions so very often a single town was important for a variety of reasons so sometimes a single town a single town was important for a variety of reasons because of variety of reasons because of several reasons a single town was became very important for example madura and madura has been an important settlement for more than 2500 years and it was important because it was located at the cross roads of two major routes of travel and trade from the north west to the east and from north to south so madurai uh, was very important why madurai was very important because it was important because it was located at the cross roads of two major route it was the, actually the two Uh, major route cross roads of two major route cross roads of two major routes which are that route from the north west to the east and from north to south from north west to the east and from north to south so these two routes cross roads were located in madurai then there were fortifications around the city there were fortifications sir defensive wall fortification means defensive wall so defensive walls are there around the city of madurai then and several shrines are there several shrines means a place regarded as holy a place regarded as holy like a temple church etc so several temples or several religious places are there then farmers and headers from adjoining areas provided food for people in the city so farmers and herders from adjoining areas providing food for adjoining means joined with farmers and herders joined and they provide food for the people in the madurai city and madura was also a center where some extremely fine sculpture was provided or produced so madura actually it was a center where some extremely fine sculpture sculpture means which art of making statues by carving art of making statues by carving so madura actually was a center of extremely or fine sculptures that's why madura became important city why madura became one of the important city because it was it, it was located at the cross roads of two major route it was located at the cross roads of two major route which are that route which are from the north west to east from the north west to east and another one from north to south so from the north west to the east and then another one north to south these two routes at it is located or cross roads are there in madurai and another one there were fortifications or defensive walls are there around the city around the city of madurai and there were several shrines are there holy places are there like church altar chapel temple etc so many temples are there or churches are there altars are there chapels are there anyway holy places are there that's why it was very important 
and more than that farmers and herders jointly provided food for the people of the madurai city people of the madurai at the same time it was also a center where fine or extremely fine sculptures are there that's why this city became very famous or important then around 200, 2000 years ago madura became the second capital of the kushanas and already we studied about different dynasties kushana shadavahana gupta maurya and these are different dynasties already we studied about and around 2000 years ago madura became the second capital of which dynasty kushana kushan dynasty so around 2000 years ago madura became the second capital of the kushana dynasty and madurai was also a religious center madurai was also a religious center and there were buddhist monasteries and jain shrines and it was an important center for the worship of krishna so this madura was also a religious center there were buddhist monasteries are there buddhist monasteries are there and jaina temples are there or jaina shrines are jaina holy centers are there and it was an important center for the worship of krishna also so several inscriptions on surface such as stone slabs and statues have been found in madura so besides there were several inscriptions and inscriptions on surfaces such as stone slabs and statues have been found in madurai already we studied about inscription writings on a hard surface is known as inscriptions writings on hard surfaces like a metal or stone it is known as which one inscriptions so several inscriptions on surfaces such as stone slabs slab means large thick flat place of stone or concrete it is known as slab so large thick flat piece of stone or concrete large thick flat piece of stone or concrete is known as slab so several inscriptions on surface such as stone slabs and statues have been found in madurai that's why madura became very important and why madura became very important because variety of functions are held in madurai variety of functions are held in madurai first one and it was located madura located at the cross roads of two major roads cross roads of two major roads and the same time it were fortifications around the city and it were fortifications very de- defensive walls are there around the city and several shrines are there several holy places are there and farmers and herders form adjoining together and they are joining together and provided food for the people of the madurai city and it was also a center for some extremely fine sculptures are there fine sculptures are there sculpture means art of making statues by carving art of making statues by carving and beside that it was the second capital of the kushana dynasty it was the second capital of the kushana dynasty and it was also a religious center madurai was also a religious center and uh, for example so many buddhist monasteries jain shrines and important center for the worship of krishna and besides that several inscriptions on surfaces such as stone slabs and statues have been found in madurai because of all these reasons madurai became one of the important city in that time so generally these are short inscriptions recording gift made by men and sometimes women to monasteries and shrines so generally these are short inscriptions and these are mainly short inscriptions that's why it is recording gift made by men sometimes women to monasteries and shrines monasteries means building occupied by a community of monks living under religious promises known as monasteries so building occupied by a community of monks living under religious promises is known as monasteries and shrines means a place regarded as holy like a temple church chapel etc so these are short inscriptions 
which were found in Madura. Madurai. These are short inscriptions recording gift made by men, sometimes women, and to monasteries and shrines. And these were made by kings and queens, sometimes officers, merchants or craft persons who lived in the city. So these inscriptions made by sometimes kings and queens or merchants or traders or officers or craft persons and they are live they were lived in the city. So for instance, inscriptions from Madure mention goldsmith, blacksmith, weavers, basket makers, garland makers, perfumers, and these Madure that two inscriptions and all mention goldsmith, goldsmith, then blacksmith, weavers, basket makers, gar gar garland makers and perfumers. So from this we could understand that the major occupations of people who lived in Madure, Madure were which one? Gold, goldsmith, blacksmith, weavers, basket makers, garland makers and perfumers. Next we are going to learn about Craft and craft persons. Craft and craft persons. So we also have archaeological evidences for craft. And we also have archaeological evidences for craft. We also found evidences that existed craft. So these include extremely fine pottery known as the Northern Black Polished Ware. So these were include extremely or fine pottery extremely fine pottery and what was its name known as the northern black polish ware nbpw nbpw and what is the full form of nbpw northern black polish ware so it gets its name from the fact that it is generally found in the northern part of the subcontinent and it is generally found in the northern part of the subcontinent and it is usually black in color and has a fine sheen has a fine surface that's why it got its this name which name northern black polished ware northern northern means it is generally found in the northern part of the subcontinent black and uh, it was in black color and uh, polished it has a fine sheen a fine surface that's why this pottery got this name which name northern black polished ware northern black polished ware then archaeological evidence for many craft may not have survived. So archaeological evidence for many craft may not be survived. Why? And already we know that uh, the manufacture of cloth was important. The manufacture of cloth was very important. But there were famous senders. Uh, there were famous senders are such as Varanasi in the north and Madure in the south. And here both men and women work in these senders. But this cloth, it will not survive. That's why we can't uh, know more about it. So anyway, archaeological evidence for many craft may not have survived. So we know from the text that the manufacture of cloth was important. So there were famous centers such as Varanasi in the north and Madure in the south. So which are the major or famous two centers for manufacturing the cloth, one is in Varanasi and another one is in Madure. Varanasi in the north and Madure is in south. And both men and women work in these centers. Then many craft persons and merchants now form associations known as Shenas. So Shenas, what is meant by Shenas? Shenas was an association of traders, merchants and artisans. So Shenas was an association of traders, merchants and artisans. And these Shenas of craft persons provided training and procured raw material and distributed the finished product. So uh, what was the main work of the Shenas? 
and the main work of the shenas was and the shen, craft persons of the shenas they provided training they provided training and they procured raw material procured means obtain something especially with care and effort so obtain something especially with care and effort it is known as which one procured so procured raw material and they distributed the finished product and through this shenas they distributed the finished product then shenans of merchants organize the trade so then this shenans of merchants organize the trade so shenans of uh, craft person shenans of craft persons provided training procured raw material and distribute the finished goods shenans of merchants and they organize the trade then shenans also served as banks and shenans also served as bank and they also worked as or function as banks and with their rich men rich men women deposited money so in that bank rich men and women deposited money then this was invested and a part of the interest was returned or used to support religious institutions such as monasteries so this was invested so rich men and women deposited the money in that bank and that from that money uh, they got interest and that interested and that in invested interest and part of the interest was returned or used to support the religious institutions such as monasteries so shenas it was an association of traders merchants and artisans shenas was an association of traders merchants and artisans and the shenas of craft persons provided training and procured raw material and distributed uh, completed or finished goods and the shenas of merchants and that organized trade and some shenas of merchants they were uh, organized trade and some shenas what what they do they function as bank and they served as banks and this was in and very rich men and rich men and women deposited money into that bank and this was invested and part of the interest they got that was returned that was used as religious institutions such as monasteries and they used this interest for supporting for supporting religious institutions so this in in interest got by this rich people and they used this money for supporting religious institutions such as monasteries next we are going to learn about an archaeological site arikkamedu archaeological site arikkamedu so arikkamedu and it is located in puducherry or pondicherry so it is located in pondicherry or puducherry and between 2200 and 1900 years ago this arikkamedu was a coastal settlement where ships unloaded goods from distant lands this arikkamedu was a coastal settlement this arikkamedu was a coastal settlement and where ships unloaded goods from distant lands and ships unloaded goods in this arikkamedu from distant lands and a massive brick structure which may have been a warehouse was found at the site so a massive brick structure big structure which may have been a warehouse maybe it was a storehouse warehouse means place of storing goods and that will be sold or distributed late so warehouse means a place of storing goods that will be sold or distributed goods and it was found in arikkamedu then other finds include pottery from the mediterranean region such as arphare and arphare means tall double handed jar that contain liquid such as wine or oil so the tall double handed jar and that contain liquids such as wine or oil and it was known as which one arph amphore 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 so this and stamped red glaze pottery known as which one aritain ware aritain ware which was named after a city in italy so in arikkamedu there were which one warehouses are there storehouses are there and beside that there were which one amphore amphore means tall double handled jar 
ടോൾ ഡബിൾ ഹാൻഡഡ് ജാർ അത് ദാറ്റ് കണ്ടെയ്ൻ ലിക്വിഡ് സച്ച് ആസ് വൈൻ ഓർ ഓയിൽ ആൻഡ് ആൻഡ് അനദർ വൺ ഈസ് ദയർ ദാറ്റ് വൺ റെഡ് ഗ്ലേസ് പോട്ടറി റെഡ് ഗ്ലേസ് പോട്ടറി ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ് വാസ് നോൺ ആസ് അറൈറ്റിയൻ ഇറ്റ് വാസ് നോൺ ആസ് അറൈറ്റിയൻ വെയർ അറൈറ്റിയൻ വെയർ ആൻഡ് വിച്ച് വാസ് നെയിം ആഫ്റ്റർ എ സിറ്റി ഇൻ ഇറ്റലി ദൻ ദിസ് വാസ് മെയ്ഡ് ബൈ പ്രിസേർവിംഗ് വെറ്റ് ക്ലേ ഇൻ ടു എ സ്റ്റാമ്പഡ് മൗൾഡ് സോ ദിസ് വാസ് മെയ്ഡ് ബൈ ദിസ് അറൈറ്റിൻ വെയർ അറൈറ്റിൻ വെയർ റെഡ് ഗ്ലേസ് ടെറോക്കോട്ട പോട്ടറി അറൈറ്റിൻ വെയർ മീൻസ് റെഡ് ഗ്ലേസ് ടെറോക്കോട്ട പോയട്രി പോട്ടറി നോട്ട് പോയട്രി സോറി പോട്ടറി ഉള്ളി സോ റെഡ് ഗ്ലേസ് ടെറോക്കോട്ട പോട്ടറി ദിസ് പോട്ടറി വിച്ച് വാസ് നെയിം ആൻഡ് വിച്ച് വാസ് നെയിംഡ് വിച്ച് വൺ അറൈറ്റിൻ വെയർ അറൈറ്റിൻ വെയർ ആൻഡ് ദിസ് വാസ് മെയ്ഡ് ബൈ പ്രിസേർവിംഗ് വെറ്റ് ക്ലേ ഇൻ ടു എ സ്റ്റാമ്പഡ് മൗൾഡ് സോ ദെയർ വാസ് യെറ്റ് അനദർ കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് പോട്ടറി വിച്ച് വാസ് മെയ്ഡ് ലോക്കലി അനു തോ റോമൻ ഡിസൈൻസ് വെയർ യൂസ് So, Roman lamps, glass fire and gems have also been found at the site. So, in Arikya Medu, so many different kind of sites are there. Which are they? One is in a, a warehouse. A warehouse. And another one is Amphore. Amphore means tall double handled jar. Amphore means tall double handled jar. And another one is Arayatin Ware. Arayatin Ware. Arayatin Ware means which one? Red Glazed Terracotta Pottery. Red Glazed Terracotta Pottery. Pottery. Okay. Red Glazed Terracotta Pottery. Then, and another one is which one? Roman Lamps, Glass Ware, Gems. And these are the important things. thing found in this site which site arikamedu site so small tanks have been found that were probably dyeing vats used by dye cloth so there is plenty of evidences for the making of beads from semi precious stones and glass so small tanks also found there so small tanks have been found there and it may be were probably dyeing vats used by dye cloth coloring cloth then there is plenty of evidences for the making of beads and these beads making from semi precious stones and glasses so in arikamedu so many sites are there so many important things were found there which are they a warehouse and amphorae then arayatin ware roman lamps glass ware gems small tanks beads etc so these are the important things found in arikamedu so i hope that the chapter is clear read it several times complete the notes and study it thank you